Yeah, my name is uh, Justin Salonik. I am a, a math teacher here at Abington Friends. Uh, I teach middle school mathematics. Uh, today I'm going to make a fairly extraordinary claim uh, about this deck of cards. It's just a standard uh, deck of 52 cards. I'm going to make this fairly extraordinary claim, and then I'm going to endeavor to prove to you that my claim is in fact true. And I'm going to uh, prove my claim is true to you using mathematics. And the reason I'm going to do that is uh, that I want to demonstrate how I, as a middle school math teacher, uh, try to get students interested and uh, excited by mathematics every day. There are fantastic resources online uh, that you can see about uh, the direction that mathematics education is going and uh, where it needs to go. Uh, there are terrific, there are terrific TED talks about pedagogy and uh, about curriculum. But unless math educators get students excited about mathematics itself uh, as a discipline, there's really only so far we can go. So uh, to that, I have three points that I try to make to my students. Uh, pretty much every day in the classroom, whether implicitly or explicitly. First of all, numeracy matters. Numeracy is the uh, mathematical analog to literacy. Uh, it's being faster with numbers. It's being able to, to reason with numbers. And this also uh, speaks to relevance. It's important to, uh, for us to help students understand that uh, math is relevant in their lives. In fact, to help them uh, see for themselves that, that math has that relevance already. So numeracy matters. Second of all, math proves stuff, which doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Uh, you know, after all, science proves all kinds of things as well. But math is different in that math proves stuff beyond a shadow of a doubt. Math proves stuff beyond doubt. Because math is a human invention that builds upon itself, math can prove things in a way that really no other discipline can. And the third point that I try to make to my uh, classes is that the stuff math proves can be really, really cool, which uh, goes back to the fairly extraordinary claim that I'm going to be making about this deck of cards later on. But I'm going to go through these points one by one. First of all, numeracy matters. I'm going to play an audio clip of a phone conversation uh, between a customer and a phone company representative. Uh, the phone company has repeatedly quoted the customer a rate of 0.002 cents per kilobyte, and yet they are charging him 0.002 dollars per kilobyte, and nobody at the phone company seems to understand that there's a difference between those two rates. Uh, at the point where I'm starting this clip, uh, he's already been on the phone for over 15 minutes uh, trying to prove his case, and he's just been transferred to a floor manager. So uh, this is as high up on the uh, food chain as he's going to get. Hi, I, I think we've got a terminology and mathematics problem going on here. It, it, it seems very basic to me, but I think we're, we're just having a problem because of the numbers involved. 0 0.002 cents per minute was quoted for. Was quoted to me. My bill rep reflects 0 0.002 dollars per minute. $0.002. Do you recognize that there's a difference between one dollar and one cent? Definitely. Do you recognize that there's a difference between half a dollar and half a cent? Definitely. Then do you therefore recognize that there's a difference between point zero zero two dollars and point zero zero two cents? No. No. <laughs> I'm teaching math. Take 0 0.002, and we're talking about cents, right? Right, 0 0.002, and we multiply that by the amount of kilobyte uses that you have. 35893. 35893, that comes out to what you pay is 71.79. Cents. You never did the conversion from cents to dollars. I don't know, I'm not a mathematician. 0 0.002 cents. Times my 35,893. It is a number, but it's still in cents. Well, I mean, it's obviously a difference of opinion. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. Now, I edited that clip for the sake of time, but if anything, I made the phone company look better. 
Uh, <laughs> if you'd like, you can hear the entire 27 minute long clip uh, at the caller's blog, horizonmath.blogspot.com. Uh, I do recommend uh, having a listen. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's, it's painful. Uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, watching a train wreck. Uh, but anyway, uh, the caller, of course, was correct. Uh, 35,893 kilobytes at 0.002 cents per kilobyte, you multiply them together, you get 71.786, which is about 72 cents that he uh, should owe, not $72. And the enumeracy of the phone company uh, was causing him to be charged 100 times uh, what he should have been charged. And there are all kinds of examples like this that we can show our students. You just do a Google search for uh, enumeracy examples. And you can get these and you can show students why numeracy matters and why what we're doing in the math classroom is important. Okay, point two, math uh, proof stuff. I'm just gonna do a little uh, probability experiment here. Like I said, just a standard deck of uh, 52 cards. I've taken the four aces and uh, put them on the, uh, the top of the deck so I can remove them. Um, I'm going to uh, place these four aces in different places in the uh, deck. Oh, I should show you. It is just a, it's just a standard deck. It's not like it's a deck full of aces or anything like that. So I'm just going to put the aces in different places. Put one here, and uh, they are aces. Put one here, put one down here, and put one down close to the bottom. Okay, I'm just going to put them randomly in different places. So, uh, four aces, 52 cards total, and I'm going to ask our illustrious master of ceremonies, Chris Busby. Chris, I just need you to say, stop. I'm just going to uh, flip through these like this, and when you think I get to an ace, say stop. Okay, you ready? Okay, so the chances of him doing, uh, actually getting an ace are, are uh, pretty slim. One in 13, not too great. You ready? Stop. Right there? Okay. Did he get it? Oh my god. Okay. Okay, well that doesn't happen very well. Uh, that, was, uh, that was impressive. That was a uh, 1 in 13 shot of that happening. Because uh, 4 in 52. Uh, well, the chances of him doing that again are less. Uh, there are 51 cards now. He's got three aces to pick. So let's see how you do. Ready, Chris? Here you go. Stop. Right there. You're trying to get one near the bottom, huh? Okay, here we go. And. Okay, there's another ace. That's uh, pretty great. So that gives us the second one, which is uh, 3 and 51. 1 17 is what that simplifies to. And the chances just keep like, getting worse. Uh, the chances now, he's got 50 cards uh, to choose from, and there are two aces. So 1 in 25. You ready? You feeling good, Chris? So far. Stop. Right there. And there's the third ace. <laughs> Uh, the chances of that happening, like I said, were uh, 1 in 25. And uh, so now your chances are really lousy. Uh, you've got uh, 49 cards left, 1 ace. Feel good? <laughs> Stop. Oh. Trying to mess with me, Chris. <laughs> Stop. Right there. Okay, closer to the middle. Okay. You, you, do you think it's an ace? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, of course it's an ace. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> so, Now, uh, the chances of that happening, uh, what, by the way, Chris, I, I suggest that you, you know, pop a plane to Vegas right now. <laughs> Have a very, very good day. Uh, if we wanted to find out the probability of doing what Chris just did uh, at complete random, we would take those four probabilities and we multiply them together. So 113 times 117 times 125 times 149. And we find out that the probability of doing what Chris just did is pretty lousy. Uh, it turns out to be 1 in 270,700. 25, which coincidentally turns out to also be very close to the probability that you will get struck by lightning this year. So drive here. <laughs> now, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm uh, playing a trick. Obviously, this is, uh, this is I'm having a little fun here. But uh, the truth is that math proves that if I were being fair, if I were being fair and I were actually letting you fairly choose four cards, and I choose any four specific cards, that is in fact the probability of that happening. Math proves things like probability. Which leads me to uh, my third point, which is that the stuff math proves can be really, really cool. Um, this is the, uh, what I talked about earlier that I was going to make a fairly extraordinary claim about this deck of cards. This is uh, probably the best 
magic trick I know. Everybody ready? Just going to shuffle the deck here. I can state with nearly 100% certainty that in the entire history of the planet, there has never been a deck of cards in this exact order. That's it. Let's do it again. <laughs> I can state with nearly 100% certainty that in the entire history of the planet, there has never been a deck of cards in this exact order. I can, I can do it again. I can do it for uh, hours. I can do it for years. In fact, I could do that for millennia. And every single time, I can tell you with nearly 100% certainty, there's never been a deck of cards in that exact order. That's a pretty extraordinary claim, so I'm going to try to prove it to you right now. I have to do a little bit of math with you. I want you to just imagine that there, uh, you have three pieces of fruit. You've got uh, an apple, a banana, and an orange. And you're allowed to eat that, uh, those pieces of fruit in any order you choose. Okay? So uh, the first fruit you choose, there are three possibilities. You can choose the apple, the banana, or the orange. So there are three possible choices at first. Once you've chosen that first fruit to eat, there are only two fruits left that you can choose from. So in the second slot, you only have two possible fruits. And then once you've eaten those two fruits, there's obviously only one left. So there's only one possible fruit left. Just as we did with uh, the probability uh, uh, that we did earlier, we need to multiply these numbers together to find out how many possible orders you can eat the fruit. Three times two times one, there are six ways. So that would, it would be uh, apple, banana, orange, apple, orange, banana, banana, apple, orange, banana, orange, apple, orange, apple, banana, orange, banana, apple. <laughs> six ways. That, it, that number, it turns out, grows very quickly if you have more objects. For example, if we had four objects, uh, that would be four times three times two times one orders, or four factorial. That little exclamation point means uh, factorial. You take the number, multiply it by all the natural numbers before it. So uh, four times three times two times one ways to order four objects, that's 24. And uh, let's just use uh, Jack, King, King, and Ace. Those are the 24 ways that those can be ordered. And like I said, this grows very quickly. If I have five objects, there are 120 ways to order them. Six objects, 720, and so on. Hopefully some of you see where this is going. Uh, there are 52 cards in a standard deck. That means the number of ways I can order these 52 cards is 52 factorial. 52 times 51 times 50 times 49. All the way down to one. How big is that number? Well, it, it's pretty big. <laughs> it looks like this. <laughs> I'm not going to waste uh, my time saying that number. We're just going to shorten it. We're going to call it 8 times 10 to the uh, 67th, which is, uh, which is uh, actually much, much less than that number is, but it's, it's close enough for what we're doing. So uh, just how big is that number? A, you're looking at, well, is it the um, you know, number of grains of sand maybe in Atlantic City? or uh, grains of sand in the entire world, or number of atoms in the entire world. Actually, this number is uh, very much on the order of what scientists believe is the number of atoms in the Milky Way galaxy. That's how many orders are possible with a deck of 52 cards. So more to the point that I'm making, we need to uh, compare that number to uh, the number of shuffles that have ever existed. You know, all the times you've ever played cards, every time you've ever shuffled, or, or in the entire history of the planet, that cards have existed. So let's just assume that in the entire history of the planet, one quadrillion decks of playing cards have existed. That's an enormous overestimate. There's no way there's been that many. But let's just say, for the sake of our argument, since cards were invented, one quadrillion decks of cards. And let's say that during its lifetime, on average, each deck was shuffled 100,000 times. Huge overestimate. A, a deck's going to fall apart before then. And think about all the decks that, you know, that get shuffled a few times and get tossed, like in, in a casino. But we're just, for the sake of argument, we're going to say uh, one quadrillion decks uh, shuffle 100,000 times each. Uh, you multiply those together, and you get a total, a total number of 100 quintillion shuffles that have ever existed. Huge overestimate. That's one with 20 zeros after it. The estimated number of existing shuffles is completely dwarfed by the number of possible shuffles. 
One times 10 to the 20th, that's the number of shuffles we're estimating existed. The number of possible 52 factorial, 8 times 10 to the 67. When you simplify this, you get 1 to 8 with 57 zeros after it. If you thought what Chris did was uh, unlikely, uh, this is approximately the probability of the same person winning, winning the multi-state mega millions lottery. That's, that's the one that's the hardest to, to win, the, the worst uh, chances. Uh, the same person winning that lottery five times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're thinking right now, well, that's never going to happen, then you get it. <laughs> this means that every time that you have ever shuffled a deck of cards, well, I don't mean like right out of the pack, I mean you have to, you have to shuffle well, but if you've ever shuffled a, uh, had a well-shuffled deck of cards, then you can state with nearly 100% certainty there has never been a deck in that exact order. So, so there it is. Uh, math uh, proves stuff. That's really, really cool. It's the power of proof. If your curiosity has been piqued, um, if you feel slightly more in awe of what mathematics can do than you did before I started my talk, uh, then you understand that math teachers can help our students feel very much the same way. And in trying to create a more numerate society, uh, it's not a bad start. Thank you.